All right, so here we are at chapter 11. Going to be covering carbohydrates, going to be taking a look at the structure of these molecules and what kind of things they're doing for us. So what are our objectives in this chapter? Well, we're going to learn about monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. And you probably already know something about that. Because what is a saccharide? Well, it's a sugar. And mono and di and poly just tell us about how many sugars, more or less. They're kind of giving you a number. We're going to learn about the ring structure of sugars, because they have a tendency to do that uh, when they're in solution. We're going to define pyranose ring and a furanose ring. It's just basically how many carbons are in that ring. We're going to learn to identify the D and the L in antimers, or the D and the L um, configuration of these molecules. You'll see what goes into naming that. And we're going to learn how to identify the alpha and the beta anomers. This is actually the hard part of the lecture. Um, this these animers are not that hard once you figure out what's happening but getting there can be a little bit difficult and the good news is there are no calculations in this chapter and the homework is the take-home quiz that you're going to find on blackboard so that's kind of summing up this chapter so let's get started all right so what is the carbohydrate well carbohydrates are the molecules that our cells use to make energy for metabolism that tends to be how we know them uh, they do other things for us as well uh, in addition to making energy they have some other things that they do and we'll talk about that but essentially they're required for life we cannot do what we need to do without carbohydrates um, it, it it's essential for us to have carbohydrates in order to make ATP, which is cellular energy. All carbohydrates come from plants, whether it is the simple carbohydrates such as sugar, honey, maple syrup, or the complex carbohydrates that we get from our vegetables. So that's a little bit about that. So I mentioned that carbohydrates come from plants. This is the chemical formula for it. So when you have carbon dioxide in water, a plant in the presence of sunlight will take those molecules and turn it into glucose which is C6H12O6 and oxygen and that plants gonna get that carbon dioxide from us because we breathe it out and we get to breathe in the oxygen that the plant makes as a result of also making that glucose molecule so photosynthesis is essential in order for us to have carbohydrates because that's what plants are doing in order to make the carbohydrate. So when we talk about breaking down carbohydrates in the human body, amylase is one of the first enzymes that um, carbohydrates that we eat encounters, amylase. This is an enzyme, it's in our mouth, and it starts the breakdown of carbohydrates as part of digestion. Um, once we get the carbohydrate into the body, cellular respiration is going to use that glucose along with oxygen to produce ATP. Now, if this was a biology class, we'd be learning about the citric acid cycle, the Krebs cycle, and the two turns of the wheel. But for this class, what I'd like for you to know is that cellular respiration takes glucose and oxygen and turns it into ATP. That's really what I'd like for you to know. Keep it really basic. All right, so there are other uses of carbohydrates. So for example, um, carbohydrates are actually part of the foundational components of other molecules, such as our RNA and our DNA. And in fact, our RNA, RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. And it has a ribose sugar ring, which we see here on the left, as part of its foundational um, structure of that molecule and it's just a little bit different than the sugar ring that appears in our DNA and DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid so the difference between these two molecules it's highlighted here on the left you see that pink square with the OH in it that's what we have there on the ribose on that second carbon we have an OH group and if we look to the right in blue on that same carbon, the analogous carbon, which would be the second carbon in the ring, it has only an H, which is why we call it deoxy 
ribose, as in deoxygenated. So that's the difference between those two mo molecules, those two sugar rings. Otherwise, they're identical. So it is the presence of oxygen or the lack of it. Um, and that's just how the body uses it. So sugar is foundational to uh, uh, a lot of the molecules that our body uses as a result. And this is what it looks like. Um, yep, there, and all that spelled out. Other uses for carbohydrates, um, cells, you have to have a way of saying, hey, this is me. And carbohydrates end up serving a function to do just that. So when we're first born, uh, our immune system isn't fully functioning. And so we're relying on mama's immune system. And we get some of um, antibodies from mama's milk. And while that's happening in the first few months, our body's going around, it's taking a look at all the cell types, and it's reading what's on the outside of the cell. It's taking a look at these carbohydrate markers, and it's learning who self is. Because the immune system needs to know who self is so that it will not attack self when an immune response gets triggered. So, for example, if you have a red blood cell, there's a bunch of different markers that appear on a red blood cell, but let's say one of them was the carbohydrate marker for yourself, like me, Rebecca. Well, here comes your white blood cell, and it takes a peek at that marker, and it goes, oh, that's cool, it's Rebecca. And it knows not to attack that particular cell because it's got the right type of marker that it recognizes for being you. But what if this guy comes along? Well, he's got a marker, too. And it might say something like this, not Rebecca, at which point your white blood cell says, this is not cool, and it will attack that invader that it doesn't recognize as you. So this is another way that carbohydrates are important to us. Now when we talk about carbohydrates, um, they're going to have an ending to them. They have a, a similar ending to their name, and it usually appears as an OS ending. So for example, glucose, fructose, galactose, and of course ribose and deoxyribose. These are all examples of carbohydrates with those OS endings. So when you read your um, uh, nutritional labels on your food, you might see something that says maltose or dextrose. Well, those are a form of carbohydrate too, and your body will handle those mostly like carbohydrates. It does some funny stuff with some of them um, because of how they're <coughs> configured, but for the most part, they're sugar, and your body will treat it that way. Let's talk a little bit more about how we identify carbohydrates. Saccharide means sugar. And when you have monosaccharide, that means that you have a single sugar ring. It's a one sugar ring. And glucose is our simplest sugar that the body can utilize. And um, it is considered a monosaccharide. Now, the prefix di means two, two sugars. And maltose, and you know it's got that os ending, it's a sugar. This is an example where we have two glucose rings linked together forming a larger, slightly larger molecule called maltose. Now oligosaccharide means that you have a few sugars. That terminology is not used as much as polysaccharide. Poly means many and uh, there's going to be a lot of these sugar rings that are strung together. Glycogen is the way that our bodies store glucose. So for example, you eat a nice hearty um, lunch and your body's going to take a lot of that glucose immediately and use it for fuel, but your liver is going to be counting that and it says, oh look, there's a few of these uh, sugar rings floating around that we don't need right now and I can store those because I know at three o'clock Molly's not going to have eaten anything and uh, she's got to be sitting through a chemistry class and uh, we don't want her brain to shut down. So um, I'm going to store these, link them together, going to knit all these little sugar rings together. And when she needs them, I can start unfurling these sugar rings and dropping them into her bloodstream so her sugar levels don't drop while she's trying to think about chemistry. So these are some of the names that you're going to see if you're talking about sugars. You're going to refer to them um, according to the number of sugar rings that are in the molecule. Because a lot of sugars are made up of these subunits, we can also refer to sugars as um, a polymer. So a polymer is basically a large molecule formed from many of the same or similar repeating units called monomers.
So if we take, for example, our polysaccharide, our uh, glu uh, glycogen, it's made up of a lot of monomers that are the glucose rings. And when we string them all together, we would get a polymer. So our monomer, in this case, is going to be the glucose, and our polymer is going to be the glycogen. So this is just a little bit more language that you might encounter if you were reading about sugars. All right, like I said previously, monosaccharides are, are single sugars. And um, a monosaccharide is technically defined as a carbohydrate that cannot be hydrolyzed into simpler carbohydrates. And what that means is that you can't break the sugar down into smaller units. And the way that sugar is broken down into smaller units is through breaking down a sugar molecule and attaching the parts that get um, created as a result of breaking down a sugar molecule, attaching it to the parts of the sugars, the sugar rings, that get disrupted when the bond between them gets broken. So let's take a look at that. So here's maltose. And we can see, let's see if I can do this. Right here, yeah, I guess I can. Where they're linked together right here, there should be um, a hydroxide right here off, off of this, and there should be another hydroxide right here off of this. And the way that we get that is we break a, a, a water molecule in two. So let's say that this oxygen is going to stay right here. Well, we can't just have an oxygen. It needs to be an O and an H. So the H from our water that we're disrupting is going to be applied right here. And when we take an H away from water, what we get left with is an OH. And if we take the O right here and leave it with this molecule, it's going to leave this spot right here off of this glucose with nothing. So the OH that we created by snagging that H off of water that we put right here, that remaining OH gets to go right there. Um, this, this is covered in another slide, so don't worry about repeating this part of the video. Um, I'm going to go through this again, but when you take that water molecule and you cut it in half, we call it hydrolysis. Hydro standing for water and lyse to break down. So that's where that comes from. All right, um, when we're talking about identifying these sugar structures, uh, we're going to be talking about several structural structural features and one of the things we're going to be talking about are the number of carbons in the sugar chain. Um, and the way a lot of the sugars are put together is that you're going to see these different groups off the end of the sugar. So here we have um, this aldehyde group, so you would have this kind of oriented wrong. What we would normally have is this carbon up at the top and this R group. This R group is nothing more than a bunch of carbons and oxygens and hydrogens that are part of the sugar, the sugar molecule. And they're going to be attached to this carbon here at the end. And if it's a carbon that has an oxygen that is doubly bonded to and a hydrogen, then we would call this an aldehyde group. The other possibility is that what we have right here, where we could have our carbon, hydrogen, oxygen that's making up the bulk of our sugar molecule attached at the end here, a carbon, doubly bonded oxygen, and maybe, I don't know, maybe another carbon and uh, hydrogen group off here to the end. So this R is just basically representing some sort of a um, hydrocarbon group um, that's attached to the group of interest, which is this aldehyde or this ketone. This is the only time we're really going to talk about this. I just like to start to introduce this idea at this point. So we're looking at the number of carbons. We're looking at the type of ending that it has. Um, and the other thing that we're, we can talk about is how it gets configured, because these things exist in three dimensionals, um, three dimensional. <laughs> Uh, three-dimensional space, and uh, we call this um, stereochemical configuration. 
and it has to do with these centers of chirality. Now chiral refers to handedness, just like a chiropractor is someone who does work with their hands. Chiral refers to handedness. So when we're talking about these sugar rings, we can have sugar rings that have the same chemical formula, but depending on how they're figure, configured, we might have one that has like a left-handed quality to it, or we might have one that has a right-handed quality to it. And when we have handedness, um, we have the same sorts of uh, groups attached to our carbon chain. We have maybe them on the same level of carbons, but instead of having like a hydroxide off to the right, it might be off to the left. And so that just like our hands are mirror images, they're not superimposable. They're mirror in images of each other, but you can't stack them one on top of the other and have them be identical. And that's technically the definition of chirality. So we talked about chirality earlier in the term and it makes its um, debut in this chapter right here when we're starting to talk about the structure of our sugars. So let's go to the next slide and I think this will start to make a little bit more sense. Oh, there's the handedness right there. Same formula, but not superimposable. Right. When we start looking at these sugar molecules, there's a couple of ways that they're going to be written, and one of them is the Fisher projection. And we've written molecules kind of going from left to right, but with the Fisher projection, we're going to be writing, uh, writing them from, I guess, the bottom up. So a Fisher projection of a simple molecule like glyceraldehyde is going to look like this. And I'm going to get you oriented to what we have here. So here we have a carbon, and we have another carbon, and we have a carbon. And if we look at this carbon up here, we've got this carbon doubly bonded to an oxygen and a hydrogen, and this would make this an aldehyde. So that's what was being explained on the previous slide, is what this upper region is going to be. It's either going to be a ketone or it's going to be an aldehyde. Now, uh, when we look at, at this particular molecule, it's going to exist in three space, in three dimensions. And it's this character right here that's going to play a role in helping us determine our center of chirality, or not necessarily the center, but the chirality of the molecule. Because we could write this molecule this way, or we could write it that way. So if the hydroxide, this is a hydroxide, it's an OH, and here they're writing it HO because they're showing this oxygen connected to this carbon. Um, so if we look at this guy over here, our HO group, it's to the left. If we look over here, we got an O group, it's off to the right. Well, when we have a hydroxide off to the left, this makes it an L configuration. It is an L enantiomer. And if it's off to the right, it makes it the D enantiomer. So this is telling us about the center of chirality. And I'll make it really clear. It is not this first carbon, it is this second carbon. And the location of the hydroxide that tells us whether we're dealing with an L or a D. If it is a HO group off to the left, it's an L. If it's an O group off to the right, we're talking about the D. So that is a, the definition of, I guess, the enantiomer, the D and L enantiomer. You're looking at the second carbon up when written in the Fisher projection, and you're seeing which side the, the hydroxide's on. All right, so enantiomers, I used that word just a second ago. And an enantiomer is when you have a chiral molecule that are mirror images of one another. So we just saw that with our glyceraldehyde. They're mirror images, but they're not superimposable. You can't lift one and stack it on top of each of the second one and have it be identical. So when you have that, then it's telling you when you have the scenario where they're mirror images but they're not stackable on each other, then you've got handedness. You have one that looks like it's a left-handed one and you have another one that looks like the right-handed one. And it is this hydroxide coming off of that second carbon up when written in the Fisher projection that's going to tell you what's going on there with that. All right.
So, um, I've lost my place. Let's see, where, where am I? Oh yeah, what about longer monosaccharides? Like, uh, what if we have something that has more than three carbons in it, like four carbons? Well, we're going to write it like this. And we can have a scenario where we have all of our hydroxides off to one side or off to the other side. And who are we going to look to to determine our center of chirality? We're going to look to this guy right here. And whatever this molecule is, here we have our hydroxide off to the right, and here we have it off to the left. And if it is off to the left, it's going to be L. And if it's off to the right, it's going to be D. And this particular molecule does have a name. It's called erythrose. And so with the hydroxide off to the right, it's going to be our D enantiomer. And with the hydroxide off to the left, it's going to be the L enantiomer. Now, it's entirely possible that those O's and H's aren't going to end up on the same side. It's possible that you could have them separate, like where you got a ho and an o, and on the other molecule you could have a, an o and a ho. And in fact, that does exist for this particular molecule. Yep, they're not, yep, yep, yep. It could look like this, or it could look like that. And these molecules do not behave the same way as the friends off to the left, and so they're not called the same thing. In fact, they're called a different name altogether. Um, Let's bring that up here. We have D3Os and we have L3Os. And that red arrow is pointing to the center of chirality, the second carbon up, looking to that hydroxide to determine whether we are the D enantiomer or the L enantiomer. And you can see that um, on the first, and the first case, it, the hydroxide is off to the right, which would make it the D, and the second, um, the one to the far right, our hydroxides to the left, which would give us the L enantiomer of our 3 os molecule. And because, you know, we haven't covered enough language already, let's cover some more. Um, why am I losing my pages? There we go. Stereoisomer and diastereomers. More language. A stereoisomer is when you have a couple of molecules, a few molecules, or several molecules that have the same molecular formula and are bonded in the same sequence but they differ in three dimensions. So that's what we just saw on the other slide, was same molecular formula, bonded in the same sequence, but they exist three-dimensionally differently. And then you have something that are called diastereomers. And these are types of stereoisomers. And this happens when you have several stereoisomers that have different configurations at one or more, but not all, of the equivalent stereocenters or centers of chirality, and they're not mirror images of each other. So that's getting really wordy. So let's just move on to the next slide and take a look at a picture that helps us describe what's happening here. So if we bring back our friend, erythrose uh, and threos. This is a really good example of what we're talking about as far as uh, diastereomers and enantiomers. So if we look at the erythrose molecules, we see that they're mirror images, but they're not superimposable. And if we look at the threos molecules, we see that the same is true for these guys. And when they're mirror images, but they're not superimposable, they're called enantiomers. So erythros and threos are enantiomers of the D and the L versions of themselves. So D erythros and L erythros are enantiomers. D threos and L threos are enantiomers. Now is D threos and D erythros enantiomers? No, they're not. Because they're not mirror images and they don't even exist in three dimensions in the same way. Because if we look right here, we have an OH to the right off of our first center of chirality. We have an OH to the right off of our first center of chirality. But on our second center of chirality, we have a, an OH off to the left, whereas up here we have one that's off to the right. And when we have this scenario where we have different centers of chirality, presenting differently, meaning that we have a structure that is different in three dimensions, not mirror images of each other. That's what we call 
a diastereomer. So we could say that that's true for these two molecules. We could also say that it's true for these two. And we could in fact say that it is true for all of them. That when you look at one, the other three are diastereomers of it because they have the same molecular formula, they have the same type of connectivity, but when it comes to these centers of chirality here and here, here and here, those OHs exist differently, meaning that in three dimensions, each one of these molecules exists differently, and that is what makes it a diastereomer. So, hopefully that's clear. So we can predict how many of these uh, diastereomers or these stereoisomers we're going to have, and it follows a formula like this, where we have 2 raised up to the power of n, where n is the number of centers of chirality in our molecule. So if we take a look at our simple sugar molecule, glyceraldehyde, we have only one center of chirality right there. And if we have one center of chirality, it's going to be uh, 2 raised to the power of 1, which means 2. And we know that that means that this OH can either exist off to the right or it can exist off to the left. And that would be our two stereoisomers. Done. But what if we had something a little bit more complex like our erythros? Well, we just saw that on the previous slide. In fact, we saw that there are four possibilities for this, for this molecule. We could have the D and the L erythros. We could have the D and the L three of, so it's four different molecules. And if we plug these two centers of chirality into our formula, then we can see that the formula bears out that, in fact, yeah, we do. We're going to have four different molecules, which are going to be diastereomers of each other or stereoisomers of each other. And that can be predicted with this formula. If we have a slightly more complex molecule, like our ribose, it has three centers of chirality, and it can be predicted that it's going to have eight different configurations that it will exist in because of all the placement of these OH groups. And if we were to look at something like glucose, it's going to be more complex still because it has four centers of chirality, which means that it's going to end up having a total of 16 different stereoisomers or 16 different diastereomers. So um, there you are. If they exist uh, in three dimensions differently, they're going to behave differently in the body. And that's why all that's important. The good news is, is we don't have to know what that is. We just have to have some idea that this is happening and be able to define it when somebody asks us in our very near future. All right, now in aqueous solutions, these uh, five and six carbon simple sugars spontaneously go into ring structures. And uh, how does that happen? Well, if we take this Fisher projection of glucose, and you see how I've numbered it, I start at the carbon at the top. Now I'll go through this. Here's a carbon, carbon number one, and it is doubly bonded to an oxygen, singly bonded to uh, a hydrogen. That means it's an aldehyde end right here. So carbon number one is here. Carbon number two is here. Carbon number three. Carbon number four. Carbon number five. And this is carbon number six. This second carbon from the bottom is going to be the one that tells us about D and L enantiomers. But we have six carbons. And I'm numbering them this way because the next picture is going to show you what's happening to put it into that ring structure. So this is glucose, D-glucose, as a matter of fact. So what happens when it goes into the ring structure? It's going to involve this hydroxide right here. So let's see what's going to happen with this. So what happens is, I'm going to renumber here. So here's carbon number one carbon number one. We laid it on its side, and if it was straight, we could think of it as straight, and now it's starting to do a back bend, and it's bending backwards. And look at what we have happening right here, carbon number five. Carbon number five has this OH group on it. This OH group, the thing that gave us whether or not we were looking at a D or an L, an antimer. And what's going to happen is that this oxygen 
is going to come around and it's going to form a union with this carbon. So this oxygen that used to be part of this hydroxide of this fifth carbon, carbon number five, is going to come around here and it's created a union with carbon number one. So this oxygen right here has done a backbend. This whole chain has done a backbend and this oxygen has created a union with carbon number one. This oxygen has done a backbend and has created a union with carbon number one. This is carbon number one. Now what are the possibilities of what's happening here with this oxygen and this hydrogen? Well, what's going to end up happening is that once this union forms, it's going to liberate this hydrogen, but just for a moment because it's going to, let's pretend it's going to come over here and it's going to attach to this oxygen. That's the explanation that I'm given because it makes, I think, the most sense to explain it this way. So what can happen then is that we're going to end up with a hydroxide and a hydrogen attached to carbon number one. So here we have a hydroxide and a hydrogen attached to carbon number one. And the other possibility is that we're going to have the hydroxide and the hydrogen attached to carbon number one like this. So when this oxygen coming off of this fifth carbon attaches to carbon number one, the attachments to this carbon can either end up with the hydroxide in the downward position and the hydrogen in the up position, or it can end up with the hydroxide in the up position and the hydrogen in the down position. Do you think that's important? Yes, it is, because that's what's going to give rise to an alpha and a beta configuration. So when this newly created hydroxide coming off of this first carbon is in the downward position, we call this the alpha. And when it's in the up position, that's called the beta. Now by giving this carbon, this carbon number one, I'm going to come back over here, carbon number one, carbon number one previously didn't have a hydroxide on it. Hydroxides tell us what? Hydroxides tell us about chirality. This carbon has a center of chirality because it has a hydroxide. This carbon is a center of chirality because it has a hydroxide. This carbon has a hydroxide, it's also a center of chirality, and this one is also a center of chirality because it has a hydroxide. This carbon number one, when it's in this configuration, does not have a hydroxide. It is not a center of chirality. But after it goes into a ring configuration, it does have a hydroxide, and it becomes a new center of chirality. And we call it an anomeric carbon. And this new center of chirality is what's telling us about alpha and beta. So this new center of chirality is the anomeric carbon telling us about alpha and beta. Alpha means the hydroxide goes in the down position. Beta means the newly formed hydroxide goes in the up position. And this gives you the percentages of the likelihood of how it's going to form. So the anomeric carbon is that new center of chirality formed as a result of that hydroxide being formed on that first carbon. The alpha anomer tells us that the OH is below the ring. Let me bring that up. OH below the ring. And the beta anomer tells us that the OH is above the ring. It is above the ring. This being the ring that we just created. All right. Hopefully you got all that. All right. So these um, are forming five and six carbon rings. All right, so if it forms a five carbon ring, it's going to be named something differently. If it forms a six carbon ring, it's got a name of its own as well. So a pyranose ring is when you have six carbons plus an oxygen, one of those carbons is not going to be in the ring. And what you have here is this sort of a structure. So we've got a, oops, I didn't mean to do that. We got a carbon here, there's one carbon, here's a second carbon right here. We don't write them out. 
third carbon, fourth carbon, fifth carbon, five carbons in the ring, and a sixth one up here in the tail. That's what makes a pyranose ring. A furanose ring is going to look like this. We've got five carbons, four of which are going to be in the ring, and an oxygen. Looks like this. So here we have one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, four carbons in a ring along with our oxygen, and this fifth carbon up here forming a tail. So that's the definition of a pyranose ring and a furanose ring. Now when we draw these rings, we're using what is, what's called a Hawthorne projection. So the Hawthorne projection is the drawing of that ring structure. And what we start with is a Fisher projection. And we're going to take this Fisher projection and we're going to turn it on its side, going to uh, rotate it 90 degrees clockwise so it looks like that. And you can see I've kept all the numbers in the same place. And keep in mind it is We've already seen this guy. It is this hydroxide. This whole thing is going to do a back bend. And this hydroxide, this oxygen right here, is going to bend backwards and it's going to create a new union with this oxygen, I mean this carbon right here. It's going to donate its hydrogen to the oxygen that's attached to that carbon. And it's going to create a hydroxide group, which is now going to make this carbon that new center of chirality known as an anomeric carbon. So that's why we show it doing this back bend. So it is this part of the structure bending backwards. So this part of the structure bending backwards, this oxygen, this oxygen going to form this union right here. And this oxygen that was attached to this carbon is going to become a new center of chirality. And those are analogous structures. The other thing that uh, Hawthorne projection is, is going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to put our hydroxides in the right position. I'm not for sure if this slide's going to, yeah, it sure is. So where we see this hydroxide in the down position off of our second carbon, carbon number two, carbon number two, hydroxide in the down position. If we look here to carbon number three, our hydroxide's in the up position. So we have hydroxide in the up position. What's carbon number four going to have? Well, carbon number four has a hydroxide in the down position, and we need to make sure that we're honest with that in our Hawthorne projection, so we see it written like that. So when we take our Fisher projection and rotate it clockwise 90 degrees, it's going to get us set up for putting all of our hydroxides in the right position for our um, ring structure. All right, so these are the steps. Turn the Fisher projection um, 90 degrees clockwise, and all the OHs on the ring, uh, on the right of the Fisher projection are going to be below the ring, and all the OHs on the left of the Fisher projection are going to be above the ring. So I've already demonstrated that. So these two guys were below the ring, and here they are, are on the right, so they're below the ring. And this guy is on the left, so he'll be above the ring. And that's how you do that. So you'll be shown some of these uh, images and have to detect where they were originally. So we're going to do a Hawthorne projection with fructose. And I'm going to point out something interesting about fructose. Here we have carbon number one, and here we have carbon number two. Now carbon number two is the one that is doubly bonded to the oxygen. And in our previous example, instead of this big molecule-ish looking thing right here, we had just a simple hydrogen. And that was what we called an aldehyde. So we had that aldehyde ending. Because we have another R group right here, R meaning alkyl group, where we have carbon, hydrogens, and maybe an oxygen, um, this is our second R group coming off of this, which means that this entire ending is a ketone. Now, because it's a ketone, um, we're still looking, to, well, not because of, but this is a ketone, identify it. This second carbon is going to be the carbon that is going to be the one that's in our ring. It is this second carbon 
that our oxygen down here off of our fifth carbon is going to do the back bend and create the union with. Not this carbon, not this carbon off of our R group, this carbon right here. When we have this oxygen do the back bend and bind with this carbon, then this oxygen that was previously double bonded to this carbon is going to be a new hydroxide, which will make this carbon a new center of chirality, which is the anomeric carbon. So I wanted to point that out. So here we're going to be looking at, instead of carbon number one, carbon number two, because carbon number one is part of another R group. All right, so let's turn this 90 degrees clockwise. So it's going to look like that. Now one of the things that we need to pay attention to is where are our hydroxides located now that we've turned this on the side because some of them are going to be above the line and some of them are going to be below the line and that will tell us whether they exist above the ring or below the ring. Now the other thing to keep in mind is that this oxygen as this whole thing does the back bend, it is this oxygen right here that's going to turn around oops, and create, that's going in for the wrong carbon, come in and create the bond right here. So instead of having a hydrogen and a hydroxide, we're going to have this group and a hydroxide attached to our new center of chirality, our new anomeric carbon. So let's draw that. Going to look like that. All right. Just to go over it one more time, carbon number two, right here. Carbon number two created that back bend, or the whole thing turned around, did a back, back bend with this oxygen, this oxygen, creating this new bond right here with carbon number two. Carbon number one is part of that um, R group, which makes this whole ending um, a ketone. And we can see we have carbon number two is now in the ring, carbon number one is not. Carbon number one is not in the ring because it is not the target for this oxygen. It's just part of what was attached to that, that oxygen. All right, if we look at carbon number three, carbon number three has a hydroxide up in the air, and we're going to replicate that right here, like that. What about carbon number four? Well, it has a hydroxide too, but it's not up in the air. It's pointing downwards. All right, that leaves us with one other thing to take into consideration. Now, when I set this particular molecule up, I put this R group up in the air, which means what needs to go right here? That's right, the OH. And if we have an OH in the down position coming off of our anomeric carbon, what's that called? Well, that's the alpha. And because we started out with a D fructose, we know it's D fructose because it says it right over here. If it, we start off with a D fructose and we put that alpha, um, if we put that hydroxide off of our anomeric carbon in the down position, we know we're going to get the alpha configuration. Well, what if it looks like the other way? Like if we reproduce everything except we put that hydroxide up in the air. Well, then we've got the beta version of our D fructose. All right. That wasn't too bad. All right, if we do this with D ribose, we're going to turn it 90 degrees right. And oh, look, all of our OHs are in the down position. And we really only have OHs off of carbon 2 and 3. Oh, and look, it looks to me like we're going to have only four carbons in our ring. It's going to be one of those Furnos rings. So let's do that. Let's see if we can't figure this out. So keep in mind that it's going to be this hydroxide coming over here and blending with carbon number one. Carbon number one this time because I don't have any carbons hanging out here. I just have this doubly bonded oxygen and just a simple H group. So let's do that. So it's going to look like this. So we know that, uh, what are we going to do next? We're going to populate it with those OHs. We're going to have an OH off of two and three. And of course, we're also going to have an OH off of carbon number one. So we could have a carbon, um, a hydrogen, uh, hydroxide off of carbon number one up in the air. Um, that's a possibility. And we know for sure that the hydroxide off of carbon two is going to be in the down position. And the hydroxide off of carbon three is going to be in the down position. But if we have that hydroxide off of carbon number one in the up position, then we're going to be looking at the beta D ribose. And we could do the same thing, but we put that first hydroxide down, and then the next two are also down, and this would give us the alpha 
the ribose. Now I'd originally left, um, I'd, cr I'd put this slide in so that in class we could actually go through the process of identifying what goes where and do our own Hawthorne projections. So this is a ribose mo uh, molecule, we've already seen this. And I'm going to have you just sit here for a second and take a look at this and um, think about what you have going on here. Think about what's at the top and think about which carbon is your center of chirality and which hydroxide is going to be the one that's going to create the union with which carbon. And then I'll tell you, but I'm not going to do it on this slide. Um, I don't have time. <laughs> it's horrible. I'll always be happy to answer that in the email if you need for me to. So I'll ask you the question, what do you have here up at the top? Identify what you have at the very top of this molecule. So you have a carbon doubly bonded to an oxygen and singly bonded to a hydrogen. So when the molecule does its back bend, it's going to bind to this carbon right here. So we could call that carbon number one. Now which hydroxide is going to do the back bend? It's go not going to be this one, not this guy. It's going to be this one. It is this hydroxide right here that is going to do the back bend and this oxygen that's going to come around and form the union with this one. This is written in a rather deceiving fashion, um, which is why I included it, just to kind of help you develop your eye. It is this center of chirality. This is not a center of chirality. This center of chirality that gets destroyed because we sacrifice this OH by creating a union with this carbon. But we create a new center of chirality right here. And this entire thing, this ends up going up in the air as, um, as a tail. And if you look back through the previous slides where we did the Hawthorne projection for ribose, you'll see that. Now here we have the Hawthorne projection. I want to say this is for um, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. This is glucose. And again, it's written differently. You've already seen this. So here's a center of chirality. Here's a center of chirality. Here's another one. Here's another one. This is that tail that sticks up in the air. This carbon right here, this carbon, even though we don't show it, it's doubly bonded to that oxygen, singly bonded to that hydrogen. This is going to be our new center of chirality because this carbon is going to bond with this oxygen. And as a result, this hydrogen is going to come around and bond with this oxygen and create a new hydroxide, which will make this the new center of chirality. This is glucose, and you've already seen this done. But I'd recommend that you take a few minutes to see if you can't try to reconfigure it yourself, keeping in mind where all of these hydroxides go. Actually, I think on this slide, I have the answers. Oh, looky there, I have the answers. Um, I don't know if your version of this has that or not. It, I think it does. I think I'm recording from the version that you have. So if we look at this, here's carbon number one. Carbon number one, carbon number one, this hydroxide becomes this oxygen. It's coming off of carbon number five. This is carbon number five. And look at what's up in the air. Everything that's down here at the bottom, everything down here at the bottom is up in the air. And remember, we can have um, the center of chirality, so we can have the hydroxide pointing down or pointing up. So this is glucose. Got one of these too. Ooh, I think we've seen this one before too. Now this one's a tricky one because we have a carbon up here. But are we going to use this carbon in our ring? No, hoo -hoo. we're looking for this carbon right here because we want this oxygen to be populated with the hydrogen from this guy, creating a hydroxide, giving us a new center of chirality. And what's going to happen with this guy right here? He's going to be that tail that's outside of the circle. This is going to be in the circle, and all of this is going to be in the circle. But this guy's going to be out of the circle, and this guy's going to be out of the circle. Where are these guys going to be? 
They're going to be below the circle, and this guy's going to be above the circle. Yeah, or the ring. I said circle. I meant ring. Oh, look, I got an answer right here. So, you can pause and study this if you wish. All right. Let's talk about disaccharides. Di means two, and disaccharides can, are made up of two sugar rings. Um, these are carbohydrates that when they are hydrolyzed, they will yield two monosaccharides. That's fancy language for saying that when you cut it in half, you're going to end up with two sugar rings. So we looked at maltose previously, and if we were to take this and take a uh, water molecule and cut it kind of in half with divi basically dividing it into a hydrogen and a hydroxide, you would repopulate where the linkages were and then create the appropriate OHs where they needed to be. So um, let's take a look at how these all right, so how are disaccharides joined? Well, it's by a covalent bond between the anomeric carbon of one sugar and an oxygen of an OH of another sugar. We call this a glycosidic linkage. It's a glycosidic linkage or a glycosidic bond. And what I have here in the circles are the anomeric carbons. Now. If you look up here at your definition, uh, covalent bond between the anomeric carbon of one sugar, that would be the sugar off to the left, and the oxygen of an OH of another sugar, which would be the one off to our right. So the sugar off to the right had an OH there off of the fourth carbon, as did the uh, carbon off to the left. But that OH got sacrificed, it became a water molecule somewhere, and it created that linkage. So that was where the OH previously was. That's why it's shown here in green. So a glycosidic bond or a glycosidic linkage is the carbon-oxygen bond involved in joining the two monosaccharides, keeping in mind that this is a carbon and there's an oxygen. There's a carbon and it is also bonded to that oxygen. All right. So monosaccharides are not stable structures. So when we're talking about this, the carbons in the Fischer projection, excuse me, when we're talking about the glucose in the Fischer projection, they have a tendency to want to spontaneously go into those ring structures. Um, the ring structures can easily convert back into the straight chain structures. But once they get bonded into a glycosidic bond at that anomeric carbon, they become really stable as a ring structure, and they have a tendency to stay there. Um, so until a sugar ring is bonded to something, it has a tendency to go uh, from a ring structure to a straight chain structure back into a ring structure spontaneously. So this is what that is telling us. Now, what's happening here is um, uh, showing us that basically in water, this is what's happening. So in liquid state this is what's happening and the other thing that could be happening is that you could in one scenario have the OH above the ring making it the beta and then it'll straighten out and then when it re uh, attaches as a ring that OH could be in the down position so it's kind of like you know whatever <laughs> whatever all right so in disaccharides the joining of the anomeric carbon makes it really stable in aqueous solution. So what ends up happening is that this guy over here, really stable because this is our anomeric carbon. Now what about this guy? This guy doesn't show that he's bonded to anybody. So technically this could unfurl and become a straight chain again. But this guy, he's going to stay in a ring structure because that anomeric bond is bonded in a glycosidic linkage. Now, what would make something like that happen? What would make it unfurl? What would break our glycosidic linkage? Well. It's strong enough that it requires typically a catalyst um, to break that bond. It's either going to be some sort of an acid or maybe it'll be an enzyme in the body, most likely an enzyme. I suppose stomach acid could also do that. Um, but it's a pretty stable bond. That's what this slide is basically telling you. It's pretty stable. All right. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the unjoined, yeah, I've already gone over that. So that's basically telling you that the unjoined anomeric center is unstable and it can open and close. Um, until it, it too gets bonded to something. All right, let's talk about how we're going to bond these two together. So when we bond 
um, our D-galactose and our D-glucose together, what's going to end up happening is, is that the linkage is going to involve this hydroxide and this hydroxide. Now we can't have all the O's and H's remain because, as you saw previously, there's just a single oxygen between the two carbons. There's just a single oxygen between this carbon and this carbon, which means that we're an oxygen and two hydrogens too many right now. We got to take those away. Well, what do we get when we have two hydrogens and an oxygen? Let's see, two hydrogens and an oxygen. What does that make? Hmm, hmm, sounds like a water molecule. And indeed it does. So what ends up happening is that if we take a hydrogen and uh, 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 an OH away, we end up creating a molecule and what we leave behind is an oxygen, an oxygen that is going to be bonded to both of the carbons between these two sugar rings. So it ends up looking something like that. And when we have our D-galactose and our D-glucose coming together, we end up creating a molecule known as lactose, which is the sugar that we find in milk. And that right there is our glycosidic linkage. All right, so I just showed you how that's bonded together that we were able to take the extra hydrogens and an oxygen and, and take them away from our two um, rings and they went off to create a water molecule. I didn't entirely show that. I'll show that in just a second. And we were able to create this linkage right here. Now what you'll notice is that we have this guy right there. Now why do we have this beta here? Well, we have a beta because on this center of chirality, on this anomeric carbon, this hydroxide was up in the air. And what does that mean when we have a hydroxide up in the air on an anomeric carbon? That means that we are in the beta configuration. Do you think that's going to be important when we go to name this linkage? Why, it, we sh it, it is. It's real important. As a matter of fact, we would say we have to tell about this linkage, whether it's a beta or an alpha, we have to tell the carbon involved right here. Sometimes this is carbon number two, but right now it's carbon number one. And then we have to tell about the other carbon that's in, involved, which in this case is carbon number four. So we're going to put all of this together where we're going to say it's a beta and it's a 1,4 linkage. And the way that we would say that, yeah, I'm numbering all the carbons right here. So the way that, so, and I'm also showing that previously we had a hydroxide here and previously we had a hydroxide there, just so for your orientation and help you see it. What we're going to say is that to name this glycosidic linkage, we would say that we have to uh, identify the carbons that are involved, which is why I numbered the chain, and then you have to identify the joining anomeric center as either alpha or beta. So in this case, we would say that we're looking at a beta 1,4 glycosidic linkage, and we have beta 1,4. So what happens if we were to take an alpha D glucose and a beta D fructose? We know we're alpha because here's our OH in the down position off of carbon number one. And we know that we're beta because we're in the OH position off of carbon number two. Because remember carbon number one is right here for this particular molecule because this is an R group as well, but we're not worried about that guy. Because this is not the one that could give us the new center of chirality, it's this guy. What's going to happen when these two guys come together? Well, this one's a little complicated, not impossible to do, but what's going to end up happening with, between these two guys is that this hydroxide and this hydroxide are going to get sacrificed. There's going to be one oxygen between them, so we're going to create a water molecule, and we're going to have um, an alpha coming off of this one carbon and a beta coming off of the two carbon. Do you think we're going to have to name all of that? Yeah, we sure are. So if we were to join these two off of these two centers of chirality, sacrificing those two a OH groups, what we would end up with is this funky monkey linkage right here is still a glycosidic linkage, but we would call it an alpha 1, alpha 1, and a beta two, beta two glycosidic linkage. Am I going to have you do something this complicated? No. 
I'm going to keep it pretty much like what we saw on the other slide. But I wanted you to see what would happen if two anomeric carbons created a union. And in fact, I believe sucrose is the only sugar where we have two anomeric carbons coming together. Typically what you're going to have is an anomeric carbon coming together with something like right here around number four or maybe number three, depending upon what sort of sugar it's being bonded to. But you're typically going to have an anomeric center bonding with a non-anomeric center. I just find sucrose interesting because we have two anomeric centers being bonded together. And oh look, look at what we created, a water molecule as well. All right. So in order to break up a glycosidic linkage, we're going to have to have an enzyme. And these enzymes are called glycosidases. So glycosidases are enzymes that are going to uh, catalyze or break up the glycosidic linkages. It says it, it catalyzes the hydrolysis of glycosidic linkages. Fancy languages for saying it's going to break them up. Now we have, uh, we just labeled a moment ago, alpha glycosidic linkages and beta glycosidic linkages. Do you think that's going to be important to which type of glycosidase we use? As a matter of fact, it is. Because in order to break down an alpha glycosidic bond, you have to have an alpha glycosidase. And to break down a beta glycosidic bond, you have to have a beta glycosidase. Makes a big difference. Yeah, it does. You're going to learn about that in a few more slides. So polysaccharides, what is a polysaccharide? Well, it's a bunch of sugar rings all strung together. And the most abundant polysaccharides in plants and animals are going to be these four polysaccharides right here, amylose, amylopectin, cellulose, and glycogen. We've already talked a little bit about glycogen, but we haven't talked about the other um, three. So let's talk about these a little bit right now. So starch, we've all heard about starches. We like starches, that's what a potato is, a lot of starch. So starches are made by plants and it comes from uh, putting together glucose rings. 20% uh, of our starches are amylose, 80% are amylopectin. These are starches. Am uh, animals use starch. Basically we take those starches and we turn them into sugars. That's why eating starchy, um, vegetables can be kind of fattening is because they're really just a bunch of stored sugar. This is one of the ways that plants make glucose is in the form of starch. And um, we break it down. So that's why potatoes are fattening because pa potatoes are starch. So uh, we take it and uh, turn it into glucose and then we further metabolize it through cellular respiration producing carbon dioxide, water, and of course ATP. And if we make too much of it, then we're going to store a little bit on our own as glycogen. Now what is amylose? Well, amylose is a, is a starch. It's a sugar. Um, sugar ring, starch. It's a, not a sugar ring. It's a bunch of sugar rings, polysaccharide. And it's got a particular shape to it. It's got this helical shape to it. And it's long chains of primarily alpha-1 glycosidic linkages alpha glycosidic linkages. And the hydrogens of the OH groups, um, the way they are formed, it causes the hydrogen bonding among the group and it causes this helical shape. So we see amylose as these large molecules that kind of get suspended in um, solution and we would call that a colloidal dispersion. So they're helical shaped. So these are big molecules. Um, because they're big, they, they have a tendency to interact with other regions of the chain. And in this case, amylose ends up being um, kind of like a little twisted up molecule. Amylopectin is made up of long chains of primarily alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages. And it has branches every so often at every um, uh, alpha 1, 6, you're going to see a branch there. And um, you're going to see a branch at the 1, 6, and it's going to lead to another uh, group of like 30 glucose units. So um, 
and that's going to give it a characteristic spherical shape. Now, I don't expect you to know this level of detail. I just would, I just present this um, because I find this interesting that um, the way that these long chains of um, polymers are, they'll have a tendency to interact with each other and create um, um, further shapes based upon these folding patterns. Um, glycogen, glycogen comes in looking um, like uh, chains of primarily 1,4 glycosidic linkages. It has branches at alpha 1,6 uh, glycosidic linkages, but it occurs every 10 glucose units. Um, glycogen is used by the liver and the skeletal muscle uh, as a fuel source, prefer preferentially by skeletal muscle. And cellulose, where do we find cellulose? Well, cellulose is used in uh, by uh, uh, is what's found in plants. It's what gives plants their structure. These are going to be long chains of beta 1,4 glycosidic linkages. No branching. This is what we find in wood. This is what makes wood rigid. Um, we like to take wood pulp and turn it into paper. Paper has some rigidity to it. Cotton has uh, qualities of being held together because of these long chains of uh, beta-1,4 linkages. Um, it is cellulose that provides a lot of support for plants. That's why plants can stand up straight. And it is due, because it's these long chains of it, um, it's the hydrogen bonding between these long chains of it that gives cellulose great strength. Um, amylose, amylopectin, glycogen, these are all alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages. And what's it going to be broken down by? By an alpha-glycosidase. Humans can break down alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages because we have alpha-glycosidase. Cellulose, which is uh, made up of beta-1,4 glycosidic linkages, requires beta-glycosidase. We can't break down cellulose, but cows can. Sheep can, giraffes, all of the ruminants, termites, all of these sorts of creatures can deal with cellulose as a food source because it is basically just stored glucose. And they can break it down because they have the right enzyme. For us, it just passes through and acts like a source of fiber. It's non-harmful, but we just can't extract the fuel source out of it because we don't have the enzymes to break it down. So that's when the, all that directionality coming off that anomeric carbon becomes real important. Depends upon what sort of glycosidases you have, whether you're going to be able to turn it into sugar or not. And that, my friend, is the end of this chapter. Go take that test and do really well. Take pictures of it and send it to me. And uh, I'll be recording number, what is it, chapter 12, the next one. See ya. Bye.